بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة السلام على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحاب أجمعين أما بعد yesterday's class we were mentioning chapter five باب المراقبة باب المراقبة and we explained uh, the مقصود of the word مراقبة was meant by that word the importance and the significance of that term. Also, the author, Anawi Rahimahullah, he mentioned several ayat from the Quran Al-Kareem, the Kitab Al-Aziz, regarding the concept of Allah's sight, of Allah's hearing, of Allah's watchfulness, and of Allah's uh, observance. Or we say the slave's watchfulness of Allah's ta'ala's observance. Khayran, inshaAllah. The author, and we're going to summarize the book as well as we, as we normally do, in the 60th narration, hadith number 60, he says, وَأَمَّا الْأَحَدِيثِ فَالْأَوَّلُ عَنُ عُمْرَ بْنِ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالَ بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات يوم اتطلع علينا رجل شديد بيد الثياب شديد السواد الشعر لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرفه من أحد إلى أن قال أو محل الشاهد من الحديث قال فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو قال فأخبرني عن الإحسان قال أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكون تراه فإنه يراك uh, The author he mentions the well-known narration of Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله عنه The famous report regarding the visit of Jibreel عليه الصلاة والسلام When the Prophet was sitting with his companions and Jibreel came in the form of a man we all know narration, he was wearing very uh, white clothing or very bright white clothes. He had very uh, dark, black dark hair. And he sat with the Prophet ﷺ and the different strange peculiarities that took place in that city. Okay, the highlighting point from this hadith, whereas nobody quotes the entire hadith, is when he asked him, Mal Ihsan. He says, What is Ihsan? What is the word or what is the concept of Al Ihsan? And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ihsan is free to worship Allah. As though you see Allah. And if you do not see Allah, you cannot see Allah, you will not see Allah, then know for sure that Allah sees you. And that hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So that's the highlighting point from the hadith is that one should worship Allah as though he sees him. That's muraqaba, being observant. And knowing that if you don't see Allah, because you're not going to see Allah in this dunya, he surely sees you. So for you to be conscious, and for you to be mindful and wary that there's someone who is observing you and watching you. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the concept of al Uh On a side note, the word ihsan has different meanings, different depictions. Okay, Sometimes the word ihsan means or pertains to the spirituality and the observance between the slave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ihsan meaning the highest level of Islam. Knowing that Allah sees you. And running towards Allah, rushing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam? And other times the word ihsan, it means itqan. To perfect your ibadah. To sharpen your blade. To perfect your craft. Okay? Oftentimes, a third meaning of the word ihsan is kindness. It's to be kind. Okay? To be kind. To be generous to people. Alright? Muhsineen. Alright? Okay? It's for you to be... Uh, uh, get, for you to give wealth and a lost cause And help out people who are needy So these are three meanings of the word Ihsan All three of them are mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah Sometimes they are depicted Sometimes they are mentioned to mean this The second or the third Everybody clear on this? And also the first meaning Al-Ihsan, the highest level of Islam Bidhanai Ta'ala is going to include all three Because when you worship Allah as if you see Allah and you can't see Allah, but Allah surely and certainly sees you, that is a means of perfecting your ibadah. You're not going to do anything that displeases Him. And you're going to rush, you're going to fight, you're going to struggle and hasten forth to do everything which pleases Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that's the case, then I don't see the chance of a person being stingy and miserly, or a person uh, being sloppy in their ibadah. So once more, the word ihsan means sometimes it pertains to that level of consciousness that Allah sees you Allah sees me but that's not my initiative that's my incentive I run to Allah 
I worship him as if I see him. And if you don't have that drive and that strength, that steam in your iman, then at least know that he sees you. Naam? And that is muraqabah. And sometimes the word ihsan means al-itqan. Inna Allah katab al-ihsana ala kulli shay. The Prophet tells us in the famous narration, Allah has prescribed ihsan on all things. And he mentioned about slaughtering. And he says that you should sharpen your knife. And as we've explained in our lessons on funny hadith, that is physically and also metaphysically, or literal and metaphorical, is that when you go to slaughter the animal, make sure that the knife is extremely sharp, not to put the animal in any pain and any punishment. And it also means in life, don't be sloppy. Be a professional. Sharpen your blade. Be sharp. Don't be dull. Don't be sloppy all over the place, fumbling around. If you choose to be a chef, try to be the best chef. If you choose to recite the Quran, try to be the best reciter of the Quran, to the best of your ability, of course. If you choose to do any profession or any field or any craft, make sure that it's what? He says, When you hid ahdukum, shafratahu. And that principle right there, if the Muslims, speaking with myself firstly, if we stopped and thought about it and pondered on it, that would change our lives dramatically, drastically, instantly. Is my blade sharp or is it dull and rusty? With regards to marriage, are you a good husband? Are you a good wife? Are you a sloppy husband, a sloppy wife? Always dragging and lagging your feet. Your wife has to beg you for her basic necessities. Basic rights. Everybody understand this? Not recommended things, things that you know the super husband does. Basic things. Food and drink. Basic rights. Or vice versa. The husband has to beg the wife for his basic necessities and wants and desires. Everybody understand this? Let alone the other extra subrogatory acts. Okay? When it comes to a student and teacher relationship. Maybe I'm a bad teacher. Everybody, and it's not the student's fault if the student fails. If the student is off the correct path, it's the teacher's fault. The teacher, you didn't put in the necessary efforts, the necessary skill, the necessary uh, ability. Your blade wasn't what? Sharp enough. All right, Muslims in the business, in the workplace, how many people accepted Islam because of good dealings of Muslims? Not because of jihad, not because of da'wah, but Muslims were honest people, good businessmen. They gave extra in their scale. Everybody understand this? They weren't stingy. They were generous. They, you leave your phone in the store, you come back saying, this is your phone. It's right here. You leave your, your money, your wallet, the Muslims give it right back. Hmm? So that's a very profound concept in itself. And that's the concept of uh, having a sharp blade and not being dull, speaking metaphorically. Whatever you do in life, try to do it what? In the right, in the right way. And the Muslims should avoid being bootlegs, as we say. Avoid being jack legs. Avoid being always second, third, fourth class. Everybody clear on this? To the best of what? Of the ability, of course. All right? That's election itself. And also, al hasan meaning for you to be generous. For you to be kind with your wealth. Or as Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, rahim al ta'ala, explained, one can be a muhsin. He can have ihsan with his prestige, his clout, his word. I give you a tazkiyah. I put in a good word for you. Brother Fulan is coming to the masjid. He's a good friend of mine. He's a good student of mine. Take care of him. Look after him. You're trying to apply to a school. I put in a good word for you. You help someone out with your what? Your reputation. Or you help someone out with your wealth. Or you help someone out with your physical body. Protecting the Muslims. A brother has a, a flat tire, a broke down car, or anything like this. No? So there's different types of al-ihsan and different ways of exerting al-ihsan. Moving forward, uh, we'll summarize that chapter. Um, the next uh, chapter, the author, he says, al babu said this, babun fi taqwa. He says the sixth chapter is regarding a taqwa. Regarding a taqwa. Obviously, the concept of taqwa, walilad hamd, never ever gets old. It's never a topic that's played out. It's never a topic that can be thoroughly covered. It's never a topic that can be spoken on enough. You can never encompass that, that topic. Because Allah Azza He speaks about it from the beginning of the Quran, the Mus'haf, Sharif, to the end. He commands us to have what? Taqwa. Naam? And He informs us of the virtue of those who have what? Taqwa. Everybody understand this? From the last verses that were sent down upon the Prophet was mentioning the word, وَتَقْوَ يَوْمًا it's the fear of day. Taqwa. 
All right, the blessing of taqwa, the fruits of taqwa, how Allah loves the muttaqeen, how Allah Azza just speaks about taqwa in times of war, fighting, he talks about having piety, having taqwa. Allah, he speaks about taqwa in times of peace. Naam. Allah, he speaks about fearing him, fearing the fire, fearing the day, huh? fearing a fitna that just won't afflict those who did wrong. La tusibana ladhina dhalamu minkum khasa. And the list goes on about the different styles and the varieties of the word and the concept of taqwa. Everybody understand this? Khayran, inshallah. Um, as far as the meaning of the word taqwa, then like al Hassan, it has different meanings as well. Sometimes the word taqwa is a deed. Sometimes it's a statement. Sometimes it's a situation, a hal, like sabr, like tawakkul. Everybody understand this? Sometimes Allah Azza wa he commands the people to fear him. Sometimes it's a day or the nar. Everybody understand this? Or fitna, so on and so forth. Um, so the word taqwa has different meanings, different levels. The original concept of the word, as the people of knowledge say, is wiqaya. Wiqaya, meaning the protection. A shield, a screen, a covering, a boundary, a border between you and between something that's dreadful, something that you're afraid of. And in the deen, there are different expressions of the people of knowledge of the past and of the present. Some of them, they said, a taqwa is an ta'amala bi ta'atillah, ala nura min Allah, tarjuthu am Allah, wa an tatruka ma'asiyatullah, taqsha iqab Allah, ala nura min Allah, ila akhirihi. For you to obey Allah with the expectation of Allah's reward, and you have a light from Allah, meaning Quran and Sunnah, and not taqwa upon ignorance. And for you to avoid disobeying Allah upon a light from Allah, meaning you know what to stay away from that which is haram, that which is bid'ah, that which is disobedience, and you fear the punishment and the dread of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and other ta'rifat, which are taqribiyah as well. Khayran, inshallah, the author, he says, قال الله تعالى, يا أيها الذين أمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاتي وقال تعالى, فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم وهذه الآية مبينة للمراد من الأولى وقال تعالى, يا أيها الذين أمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا والآيات في الأمر بالتقوى كثيرة معلومة وقال تعالى, ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب وقال تعالى إن تتقوا الله يجعل لكم فرقانا ويكفر عنكم سيئاتكم ويقرنكم والله ذو الفضل العظيم والآيات في الباب كثيرة معلومة The author he begins his discussion with the verse from Surah Al-Imran which Allah Azza wa Jalla says O oh, you who believe اتقوا الله حق تقاته Fear Allah in a way which is the haq the, the, the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves meaning in a perfect manner a thorough manner, a consistent manner, all of the time, every place, every situation. He then says, in Surah At-Taghabun, the day of mutual loss, in which there will be losers on that day, there will be people who will be fraudulent on that day, bankrupt on that day. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Allah says, fear Allah to the best of your capability. Now, he discusses a very deep issue and that is, when Allah told us to fear Him, He basically told us in a perfect way. As Allah deserves. Or haqqa taqwa. The right taqwa, the true taqwa, the genuine taqwa. And then He says, mastata'tum. To the best of your ability. Some of the ulama of Islam, they say that the concept of haqqa tuqatihi or wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi, fight in Allah's cause, Haqqa jihadihi, okay, haqqa jihad meaning the jihad that's true, that's real, that's genuine, as the law deserves. They say that it's impossible. It's impossible for a person to give Allah his rights in jihad as the law deserves. They say it's impossible for Allah Azza wa to be given his rights with regards to taqwa as he fully deserves. So if that's the case, if that's the beyond, if that's beyond the capability of the human being, then they say it has to be something else now because that's problematic. For Allah to tell us to do something, command us to do something that is not necessarily achievable by the human body. So some of the ulama of Islam, they say 
uh, the concept of haq al-jihad, haq al-taqwa, it says mansukha. It said it's canceled. There's no longer a ruling in the deen. Because it was something that the believers did not have the ability to do. It was once a ruling, but it's no longer a ruling. And other ulama, they say, no, bal al-ayah muhkama, wa laysat mansukhatan. They say that the ayah has not been canceled. And it is muhkam. It is as it is. And that's when Noah says, وَهَذِي الْآيَةُ مُبَيِّنَةٌ لِلْمُرَادِ مِنَ الْأُولَى The ayah from Surah Al-Taghabun, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ For Allah, to the best of your capability, clarifies what's meant by the ayah of Ali Imran. Huh? And that is for you to make the effort and to put forth the necessary uh, measures in perfecting taqwa. And if you fall short, then it's no sin upon you. If you fall short, then that's something that's beyond your ability. But you're supposed to put up all of your, what? Efforts. Everybody understand this? You're supposed to strive in jihad and take the shaitan as an enemy. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ فَاتَّخِذُهُ عَدُوًا Allah says that indeed Satan for you is an enemy. So take him as a what? Enemy. You may not perform... Uh, the battle perfectly, but take the measures and know that this person is a dreadful enemy. He's not to be played around with. He's not someone that you're supposed to listen to and lend your ear to. It's not to be someone that you just take, you know, in a laxed manner when it comes to fitan to nisa or alcohol or the dunya or wealth or this or that. It's real. And the moment you underestimate it is when it what? Sweeps your legs and you fall down. So they say what's meant by haqqa taqwa or haqqa jihad is for you to exert yourself and to realize the clear, open, manifest enmity between shaitan and between the children of Adam. That's a very long discussion. We have a class on uh, which we spoke on this called uh, Jihad and Taqwa of Ibn al-Qayyim. We did it about maybe two years ago at Masjid al-Ansar. It's on Hadith Disciple channel. You can check it out. In which we mentioned the Kalam of Ibn al-Qayyim regarding the levels of Jihad. Uh, and the Maratib of Jihad fi Sabilillah. Uh, and the different concepts and misconceptions regarding that. Khayran, inshallah. Then the author mentions the ayah from Surah Al Ahzab, in which Allah Azza wa says, O oh, you who believe, for Allah, and say a word which is sadid. And the word sadid has different meanings as well. Sometimes the word sadid means accurate. For someone to be what? Accurate. In other words, back to the concept of the. A wet stone. Be sharp with your tongue as well. Say the haq. Don't make statements that are sloppy, lies, and inaccuracies. Everybody understand this? Say that which is what? Accurate. Accurate. True. And what could be more accurate than the? Quran and Sunnah. The truth. Of the reality of a person, of a thing, of an act, of a statement. Just say the, just say the truth. That's it. That's all you got to do. Is speak the truth. And oftentimes the word sadid could mean be directing your words. Don't beat around the bush as we say. Or as it's known in the different cliches with regards to the history of this country, uh, it say, don't speak with a forked tongue. You make a promise, you make a treaty, you make a pact, and then you break it the next day. This is your land, we won't violate it, and then the next thing you know, you say you have to what? Move off of this land. It's a, a famous statement in, in American culture and history. It say, don't speak with a what? Forked tongue, like a snake, a serpent. Everybody understand this? Even though the snake, nothing about the snake is hidden. The snake is a predator. It's clear. And Allah Azza wa happened to create the snake with a slit tongue. Everybody understand this? The snake is known that it hunts. It's known that certain snakes are venomous. It's known that certain snakes have, can tell a great deal of venom. And they have sharp fangs. But man, on the other hand, he speaks with a forked tongue. Metaphorically, as if he has two tongues in his mouth. One day he makes a promise, he guarantees, he assures, and the next day is what? Total opposite. That is not cold sadid. Just be directing your words, okay? Don't beat around the bush. Don't gossip. Don't backbite. Don't smile on a brother's face and then talk about him like a dog behind his back. Are there other interpretations of cold and sadid then as well? Khair inshallah. I know what he says, and the ayat regarding taqwa are very well known. They are abundant and they are well known. And then he goes on to quote more ayat after he just said that. Allah Azza wa Jalla said in Surah Al-Talaq, And he who fears Allah, يَجْعَلَهُ مَخْرَجًا 
Allah will make for him a way out. Allah will deliver him from a leak, hardship and difficulty. What is the secret behind Allah Azzawajal mentioning this ayah concerning talaq, rulings of divorce? Is that a divorce is a tight situation. Oftentimes it's a jam. Okay, with regards to being with this woman, not being with this woman, being with this man, not being with this man, children, custody, embarrassment, money, hurt, love, deceit, and the list goes on. This is a mess. So the thing that's going to deliver you from this mess, from the courts, from the fighting, from the slander, is what? It's taqwa. And if you have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jalla, you have no worries. It wasn't meant to be. You tried, it just wasn't what? wasn't meant to be. Allah will give you a better wife and give her a better husband. It's just that simple. Or if you wish to take your wife back. It wasn't the third talaq. What was the ruling? So on and so forth. If you have taqwa, Allah will give you a what? A way out. And this is profound when it comes to marriage and divorce in Islam. The only thing that you need to worry about is taqwa. You worry about Allah. Oh, and this, and the sister, and what I want to do, and uh, I don't know. And she's just fear Allah. And don't fear the people. Allah hid your sins in the first place. He's the one who will or can choose to hide them in the future, even after you're separated. Allah is the one who exposed your sins, and He's the one who can expose them when He wants to. It's foolishness to worry about and fear the what? The slave. Everybody understand this? So Allah says, anyone who fears Allah, يَجْعَلُهُ makhrajan. He'll make for him a way out, a flight square. It seems as if he's in the corner. Yeah, everybody understand this? It seems as if you're in check. Huh? But in actuality, there is a way of escaping. Everybody understand this? And that is through taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the exalted, he then says, min la And he will provide him through ways which he never imagined. Whether it's physical, tangible rizq, or whether it's the rizq of iman, the rizq of ilm. The risk of faraj, of Allah granting you relief. Naam? Min haythu la yahtasib. From a way in which you couldn't imagine. So just stop and think about how many times you were in a difficult situation in life. You didn't know where you were going to get the money from. You didn't know how you were going to make it, how you were going to get home. You didn't know how you, when you were going to see the daylight again. You were single, you didn't know you were going to be married. Now you have children, kids. And the list goes on. Allah delivers you from that situation. Uh, then I know we Ta'ala he says, Inta furqanan, the ayat from Surah Al Anfal. He says, Inta if you fear Allah, O Muslims, Yajalakum Furqanan. He Allah will make for you a furqan. He will make for you a way of discerning, a way of knowing and realizing the truth from the falsehood. Now let's just stop and let's look at Islam today. The first thing people say is, what Islam is correct? What dawah is correct? What website should I, should I watch? What videos, what, what lectures, what books should I read? Everyone says Quran or Sunnah. Everyone says I'm Salafi. Everyone says this, so on and so on and so forth. What sheikhs recommend this person? Or what scholars, the first question, what scholars have you sat with? Or what, what scholars do you know? Or not even that, what brothers do you know? And so on and so on and so on and so forth. How many people actually sit down and look in the mirror and make sure that they themselves are fearing Allah? And if I have the taqwa of Allah in myself before anybody else, Allah will allow me to have this what? Furqan. To discern and see haq, batil. Nafi' dar. Beneficial, harmful. Whether it's through my own understanding and research or whether I'm being guided to someone that I trust that would tell me the best thing to do as a layman Muslim. And this is one of the biggest cancers that we have today. As the people, they forget the simplest, easiest cure. The cure that's right beneath their noses. Just like the actual physical world of medicine. People that go to the hospitals, they go to the doctors, uh, and they pay all types of money, they sit in line, they get all types of tests and screening done on them, and the cure is right in their backyard. Or in the refrigerator, or the cure is in the, is in the cabinet whether it's garlic or onion or honey, whatever the case may be. Everybody understand this? And they look for a special, sophisticated cure, but the simple, basic cure is what? Free. So taqwa is the key in knowing bid'ah from sunnah. Knowing who's upon it and who isn't upon it. 
How can you have taqwa if day and night you busy yourself with the next man? Day and night you busy yourself with the next woman. Day and night is this one and that one and fulan and fulana and this one and fulana alan and this and that. Kaif. Anna lakal taqwa. Where's the taqwa in this? When's the last time you went to sleep and you made the dua to Prophet Guide me to that which the people differ over. When's the last time you made that the hadith of Aisha? Ask yourself the question. People ask, call, chat, forums. Well, how many people are making that dua sincerely? Oh Allah, guide me to the truth. Everybody understand this? So Allah says that he will give you the furqan, a criterion, a yardstick, a beaming light in the fog to see what's, what's, what's right and what's what, what's not right. Everybody understand this? Allah, he then says, ankum sayyatikum. And then he will what? Wipe away your sayyat, your sins. And forgive you. And Allah is the one who possesses ever expansive bounty. Ever expansive bounty. This, the bounty which is endless, limitless. He possesses it. In other words, seek it from him and no one else. Allah possesses a bounty, no one else. Secondly, his bounty is not limited. Some human beings, they have bounty. They have something of knowledge, of wealth, of power, of this and of that. But it's what? Limited at best. That's if they even decide to give you some of it. If I wanted to give you everything I want, I can't. Because I myself have bills. I myself have my own schedule. If I wanted to teach you everything that I know, if I said I wanted to give you everything, all of the books I read, all of the classes I said, all of the secrets, I what? I can't. Because I have to sleep, I have to eat, I have a wife, I have children, I have this, I have that, and so on and so forth. So the human being who decides not to go with his stingy nature, and if he does want to be generous, is what? It's limited. Allah Azza wa has the bounty, first and foremost. Secondly, and it's what? Alim. It's ever expensive. So it only makes sense to go directly to the what? Source. Everybody clear on this? And the human being, we said, at best, is going to be what? Ajis, at best. I'll teach you Quran, but only an hour a day. Two hours out of the day. That's if he decides to take you on as a student of the Quran. And his abilities, his talents of recitation of the Quran are always going to be what? Limited. And anything else, money, anything else you want from someone, it's going to be a limited amount. So Allah is the one who possesses the bounty, which is most great. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This clearly shows the virtue, the excellence, and the merit of what? Of taqwa. The author, he says, and there are many ayats in the Quran regarding this, as we previously said. Many of these ayats we've mentioned in our different khutbas, other classes and lectures as well. The author, he then says, وَأَمَّنْ أَحَدِيثِ فَالْأَوَّلُ عَنَّ أَبِي هُرَيْنَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ قَالَ قِيلَ يَا صُلُ اللَّهُ مَنْ أَكْرُمُ النَّاسِ قَالَ أَتْقَاهُمْ فَقَالُوا لَيْسَ عَنْ هَذَا نَسْأَلُكَ قَالَ فَيُوسُفْ نَبِيُّ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ النَّبِيِّ اللَّهِ بِنِي نَبِيِّ اللَّهِ بِنِي خِلِيلِ اللَّهِ قَالُوا لَيْسَ عَنْ هَذَا نَسْأَلُكَ قَالَ فَعَنْ مَعَادٍ الْعَرَبِ تَسْأَلُونِي خِيَارُهُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ خِيَارُهُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ إِذَا فَقُهُ مُتَفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ وَفَقُهُ بِضَمِّ الْقَافِ عَلَى الْمَشْهُورِ وَحُكِيَ كَسْرُهَا أي عَلِمُوا أَحْكَامَ الشَّرَعِ الثاني عن أبي سعيد الخضري رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الدنيا حلوة خضرة وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهَا فَيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاءَ فَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ فِتْنَةِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ كَانَتْ فِي النِّسَاءِ رَاهُ مُسْلِمْ الثالث عن ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يقول اللهم إني أسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى رواه مسلم الرابع عن أبي الطريف عدي بن حاتم الطائي رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من حلف على يمين ثم رأى أتقى منها فليأتي التقوى رواه مسلم uh, He says as for the narrations, the ahadith The first is reported by Abu Huraira In which they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah They said, who is Akram al-Nas, the noblest of men Who is the noblest of the people He said, Atqahum those who have the most taqwa. The most noble people are those who have what? Taqwa. Most taqwa. Everybody understand this? So we say a noble brother, noble sheikh, noble brother. That is the term of what? 
first and foremost. Not what you look like, where you come from, who you know, who you sat with, but who has the most what? Taqwa. Everybody clear on this? And it's not just a hat that I put on. It's a, he's a noble brother. It's not just a thobe I put on and I become a what? A noble brother, but it's through my actions. My actions have to prove nobility. Everybody understand this? And if you do prove, your, prove nobility through your actions, then that's your status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it will be known among the what? The people. The Prophet sallam, uh, he then was asked, they said, we're not talking about this, O Messenger of Allah. We're not talking about the religious karam, the noblest of men. Uh, he then says, then perhaps you're talking about Yusuf, the son of Allah's Prophet, the son of Allah's Prophet, who's the son of the Khalil of Allah, the intimate friend of Allah. They said, we're not asking you about this either, O Messenger of Allah. He says, then you're asking me about Ma'adin al-Arab, the ancestry of the Arabs. He asked me about the best Arabs, the best of these people in their genealogy. Um, he then said, Khiyaruhum, he says, the best of them in Islam are the best of them before Islam, with the condition that they seek knowledge of the deen. He says, those who were good men, noble men, the knights, the horse riders, the archers, the master swimmers, those who could read and write, Hmm? Those who honored their guests, um, who slaughtered camels and did all of the noble things in Jahiliyyah, they are the best Muslims with the condition of what? Fiqh fiddin. Everybody understand this? And this hadith is agreed upon. Just stop and think about that one hadith right there. Everybody understand this? Many people, when they come to Islam, and once again they become sloppy and loose. How nice did you used to dress before you were Muslim? Your ladies' man before Islam. You come to Islam, you mistreat your wife. Or oh, brothers, before the sunnah, when you were a Muslim by name, if that, not praying, no beard, drinking alcohol, not being righteous, it were certain virtues and characteristics that you had. You learn about the sunnah, about it, and you become cheap. Everybody understand this? You become sloppy, you don't care about your appearance. huh? You don't take notice of the things that you used to take notice, what? Back then. You were a brave man in Jahiliyyah. No one disrespected you. No one disrespected your mother or your women folk. You were a fighter. You come to Islam, you become a what? Coward. Coward huh? Billah. Or you were a leader in Jahiliyyah, you come to Islam, and you become a follower, a tag-along, a yes-man. Huh? Somebody just says yes, no. Everybody understand this? That's not what this hadith is teaching us. This hadith is teaching us that the good characteristics before Islam don't fade. They don't go away, but they do what? Become even more vibrant. The color becomes better. But it's now pure. It's now disciplined. It's now within the boundary. Everybody understand this? And Islam gives you that super nobility. Everybody understand this? And the same applies as well. The opposite we understand from this hadith is that if someone was scum in Jahiliyyah, they were a low person, cheap, they're a coward, a miser, a womanizer, a thief, huh? And they come to the deen of Islam and they don't purify themselves. They don't ask Allah for the purification. They don't seek the fiqh of the deen. They don't get the good akhlaq and hang around the righteous and adopt new character. Then perhaps they remain what? As they were. And we see that on a daily basis, unfortunately. We see that on a what? On a daily basis. And Islam is not a religion that it just magically changes everything like that. There's no magic wand. You have to put in efforts to learn, to practice, and have good, righteous companionship. And you have to strive against those characteristics. The bad things that you did in Jailia, you have to get rid of them now. Everybody understand this? You have to do what? Get rid of them. Everyone isn't, isn't born a great scholar. Everyone isn't born this great warrior. Everyone's not born like that. Everyone's not born a ladies' man. But you can do what? You can learn. You can learn, and you can imitate, and you can copy the people who do have those things naturally. Everybody understand this? So it's no sin upon you if you were born with a, with a thought. If you were, if you were raised with a thought, that's, how, that's where I come from in Jahiliyyah. People did this, they smoked this, they did that. But what about now? Everybody understand this? And many people, they think that the character is just going to magically what? Change. You have a beard and a thobe, and you have the same terrible akhlaq as in Jahiliyyah. You have an niqab. Khimar, gloves, you were all black. And you have the same filthy akhlaq that you had, what? Yeah. In Jahiliyyah. Everybody understand this? 
خير إن شاء الله. Um, the second hadith is reported by Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu anhu, in which the Prophet sallallahu says, "Inna dunya hulwatun khadiratun." He says, "The life of this world is sweet and green." Hmm? Sweet and green. Everyone understand this? He says, "Hulwa, sweet, and it's also khadira. It's lush." Everyone understand this? It's lush and sweet. He says, and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustakhrifukum. Allah will make you the khulafa. He's going to make you the leaders. He's going to make you the people who run things. He gives you the position. Just like those who came before you lived on earth. فَيَنظُرْ كَيْفَ تَعْمَنُونَ And he's going to look and see how you're going to behave. Everybody understand this? This is a tremendous hadith right now. You criticize the leader. You criticize the imam. You criticize the leadership, you criticize this. When it's your turn to lead, what's going to happen now? People are going to what? They're going to look at you now. It's your turn. Okay, I was a corrupt leader. Okay, now you got it. Let's see how easy it is. Everybody understand this? Let's see what a good job that you can do. So Allah, the Prophet tells us that Allah is watching us. What are we going to do? Are we going to do like Aid and Thamud? They became haughty. They had pride, they had arrogance because of the things that they produced and manufactured, their strength, their intelligence, their wealth, the power that Allah gave them. Or are we going to be the opposite? Everybody understand this? The prophet then says as if it's a solution for the trouble of the worldly life and the responsibility and how a person is going to be held accountable. He says, فَاتَّقُ dunya." He says, so fear the dunya. Be afraid of the dunya, sucking you up and swallowing you up. Oh, it's nothing. It's permissible. Islam doesn't say I can't do this. I'm only going to do it for two years. Then I'm going to go do that. I'm going to learn it. Then I'm going to go here. Then, I, then I'm going to stop. I'm going to drink it. Then I'm going to quit. That's the position of the fool. And he doesn't realize that the dunya is a whirlpool sucking him in quicksand, quagmire. I understand this. Or a pathetic rat that's been caught by a boa constrictor. And every time the rat squeals and squeaks and tries to breathe, it does what? Until it's suffocated and strangled. Everybody understand this? He says, So, فَاتَّقُ الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُ nisa And beware of women. Because the first fitna for the Israelites was in women. That was the beginning of their end. That was their downfall. Prostitution, zina, adultery, allowing the women to go crazy, rambunctious, control them, lead them. Everybody understand this? That's the downfall. Everybody understand this? Allowing women to have no akhlaq, not teaching them, not cultivating them, not educating women, and allowing those who bear children to become rotten and rancid, and producing rotten and rancid children. Everybody understand this? So it's very dangerous, it's very profound hadith. The Prophet says, fear the world and fear women. The uh, third hadith of the chapter, and the last hadith that we'll mention here, or perhaps before the last, he says, is narrated by Ibn Mas'ud. That the Prophet used to say, Allahumma inni as'aluk al-huda wa-tuqa wal-afafa wal-ghina. He said, Oh Allah, I ask you for the following things. Guidance and taqwa. Huda and taqwa. And I also ask you for afaf, to be chaste, to do without. Ghina. And I ask you for richness. I ask you for sufficiency. Whether it's monetary means or the spiritual richness. I have a million dollars, I feel rich. I have no dollars, I also feel what? Rich. I don't have to beg, I don't need. Everybody understand this? He asked Allah for these four things. And we explained this hadith in detail in the khutbah as well. The last chapter, or the last hadith in the chapter, is reported by Abu Tarif Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i, radiallahu anhu. And he, had, he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah saying, Man halafa ala yameenin, he who makes an oath, he swears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he sees something which is closer to piety, something that's better. Then he should perform what? He should perform that. You swear to do something of righteousness. Then an idea comes as something that's better, more virtuous, then you should do what? You should do that. Khairan, inshallah. All of these hadith show us the obligation of taqwa, the virtue of taqwa, and the superiority of a taqwa, and some of the aspects of it. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for, for true taqwa and statement and in action. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.